Thank you so much, Judy. Um, um, for a strong and compelling opening to the debate tonight. Now, moving on to our first opposition speaker of the evening, we're delighted to welcome our student speaker, Lena Vishneska. Lena's a second year student reading economics at King's College. She won the right to speak through open audition. You had the years of the house. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I was quite happy to speak first because I thought that there'd be less to counter, but I think the stage has been set up in quite a challenging way for me. Um, I'll agree on several issues with Dr. Cox, uh, Cox the faults of capitalism, which I'll go into later, um, and also the manipulative forces within modern society, which lead us to not focus on the real issues and the real sources of inequality. But ultimately, I'll try to persuade you that reform of capitalism is possible and desirable. And what Dr. Cox didn't discuss is the relation between quality of goods and services and innovation and Marxism. And these things bear on all of us and arguably most significantly on the working class or on the poorest members of society. Um, and before I begin, I also interpreted the motion kind of as twofold in the sense that making Marxism work means both bringing it about and sustaining it. So I'll initially devote some time to whether or not it's feasible to bring it about in the 21st century. So starting with that, I see three paths to Marxism. A synchronized revolution like Marx foresaw, uncoordinated public disobedience, or via democratic processes. Um, a revolution, as Marx foresaw it, would entail the proletariat, to use Marx's uh, vocabulary, becoming increasingly united and conscious, and ultimately coordinating an uprising against the bourgeoisie and seizing the means of production. But I think this has become less likely with time. We've moved away from a binary class divide, despite rising inequalities, for two reasons. One is, for instance, the retail investing. A greater number of people derive at least a small part of their income from capital. And the other is the emergence of extremely high salaries. An MD at an investment bank technically is a member of the proletariat because they make money from a salary, but I'd argue they don't identify as such. So as the boundary between capitalists and proletariat has become blurred, the chances of an uncoordinated revolution have decreased. If synchronized action is unlikely, maybe we could see Marxism happening via uncoordinated public disobedience. And the argument made here sometimes is that if our system becomes so unequal that the poor have to resort to stealing to survive, um, this would threaten the institution of private ownership and hence bring about Marxism without class consciousness. But despite persistent inequality, which I fully admit, levels of extreme poverty specifically have been falling in the 21st century. They peaked in 1990 and have been falling since. So this suggests that it's unlikely that we'll reach such a level of desperation for to have widespread public disobedience. And thirdly, probably most likely, yes, the globe, which I think is relevant because Marx's idea was to bring, like, Marxism is a global ideology as opposed to a national one. Uh, uh, sorry, I'll continue. So um, the most realistic, in my view probably, is that maybe we could see Marxism brought about via, although maybe not Dr. Cox's, uh, via democratic processes, nationalization, tax increases. But here, we live in a democracy, and most of us, so the majority of people, say, in Britain, are wage earners, and so we're a re relative, ma majority relative to the capitalists. So why haven't we elected Marxist politicians yet? I'll argue later that maybe it's because people recognize that Marxism actually wouldn't be all that great for us. But even if not, um, firstly, Marxist politicians lack the money to campaign. Um, and secondly, we the proletariat, and here again I agree with Dr. Cox, uh, Cox, are being appeased. Marx foresaw intensifying conflict in a capitalist society, and yet corporations seem to be doing quite well at obscuring their influence to prevent dissent. Good example is oil companies pushing the term carbon footprint into public consciousness, so we fail to recognize the extent of their responsibility for carbon emissions. Um, and it's worth considering whether a large-scale disruption, like another economic crisis, could cause all this to change. Short answer is, I don't know. Um, but neither does the proposition. If we take the 2007-8 uh, financial crisis as a case study, I think one thing to note is that while there was widespread criticism of capitalism, um, especially the financial sector, the mainstream response seems to have been to reform capitalism as opposed to overthrow the entire system. So I think the burden rests with the proposition to show why the effects of a future crisis would be any different. 
So that was my first part on whether I don't think it's likely that this will happen. But if that didn't persuade you or if you don't think that's significant, the second part is now about why the system wouldn't be sustainable or desirable. So the defining characteristic of a Marxist society, I hope we can all agree, is that instead of having a separation between those who own the means of production and those whose labor um, is used in production of goods, in communism, the workers own the means of production. Hence, people are simultaneously workers and owners, employees and employers, um, producers and business strategists. And in this sense, there's neither specialization nor separation of power. Um, and I'll discuss the implications of these in turn, which I think are quite negative, starting with specialization. So Marx claimed famously that in a communist society, we'd be able to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, and criticize after dinner. But even if people limited themselves to just a single sector and avoided further specialization within it, we'd encounter issues. Especially with the immense depth of scientific knowledge in the 21st century, if people were to divide their attention between production and strategy, or HR, or sales, or accounting, um, issues would be dealt with at, at the very least, a shallower level than currently. Hence, to not have specialization would mean a deterioration in the quality of our goods and services. And someone could say that this is worth it due to improved well worker well-being. But my response would be that if you were to get an operation and found out just before it that the surgeon doing it only operates people as a side hustle, you'd give specialization another chance. Yes. Um, that's my next paragraph. So, let me respond to the counter that 21st century Marxism could adopt specialization to avoid these issues. So we could have common ownership of means of production, but people could specialize and pursue very jobs depending on their skills and preferences and so on. At the same time, argue Marxists, we'd have similar or the same level of earnings. So I don't believe, for one, that this would be sustainable in the 21st century. As soon as people start having different jobs and responsibilities, those who feel like their jobs are more important because they get to manage others would demand higher wages and we'd see a gradual move back towards hierarchy and inequality, including in wealth. That's unless Marxism could change our perception of the importance of jobs. Sorry, let me finish. Maybe. Maybe it could, maybe it could change our perception, but if we look at the Eastern Bloc in the 20th century, it doesn't seem like the notion of hierarchy was eradicated, even after 40 plus years. Um, hence my argument that specialization is on the one hand unavoidable, and on the other hand destructive. And my next point is that collective ownership, um, which is inherent to Marxism, leads to conflicts of interest which hinder innovation. So in capitalism, whether this is good or bad is quite simple. The owners make the decisions, and chain of command is quite clear. In a simplified sense, those higher up have more power than those below them within a company, and top tier management answers to the shareholders. In communism, however, there's no shareholders, or conversely, we're all shareholders. And I think it's quite intuitive why this violates the principle of separation of power, because technically, as a worker, you'd partly be your own boss. And while this may seem attractive at first, it would also imply conflicts of interest. Imagine a business opportunity that would lead to better quality products and higher future profits, like shifting to a new technology of production. The current workers who make the decisions would likely not approve of it. Why? Well, they may believe that this technology will replace their jobs, or they may be uncertain about its effect and hence lean towards the status quo. Um, in the aggregate, that would mean that we're missing out on innovations in production. Um, and while with today's fears of job security, especially in relation to AI recently, some may think that this is a fair trade-off, I'd argue that stagnation is bad for all of us. Um, just look, at back, look back at history um, and at the stat I gave for bringing people out of extreme poverty. Historically, we've relied massively on innovation to develop, to name a few, healthcare, agriculture, and transport in ways that have dramatically improved standards of living, including or especially for the extremely poor. Um, sorry, I'll continue. This is not to say that modern capitalist system isn't subject to this short-termism that I'm referring to um, in, in Marxism. In public markets, there's pressure to perform well every quarter, so your share price doesn't fall when you publish your financials. In private markets, um, funds purchase companies for a typical horizon of seven years, so there's little incentive to be concerned with what happens to a company after this time. But arguably, these cases are talked about a lot, but actually somewhat more limited. A wide range of companies are under the kind of ownership that's there for the long run. Take family-owned firms. In communism, however, all companies would be in the situation I've just described, where workers are subject to a conflict of interest. So, so far I've argued that Marxism can't work in the 21st century because it would reduce the quality of what we produce and prevent progress. But this is by no means to say that capitalism, in its current form, is working well and should be left untouched. 
Modern capitalism has coincided, as I've argued, with some amazing events, most notably bringing 1.2 billion people out of extreme poverty. But it's not difficult to see many flaws of the system that we currently have. I've already mentioned the role of money in politics, the obscure power of corporations, and the risk of short-termism within the finance industry. Indeed, I believe some of Marx's critiques have stood the test of time. Returns to capital outweighing returns to labor, or the unpleasant character of specialization, which reduces human labor to dull, lonely, and repetitive tasks. But despite all this, I urge you to side with the opposition in today's debate if you believe that a reform of capitalism is a more realistic aim for the 21st century than Marxism is. Because Marxism is not only unlikely to be feasible, but it would probably lead to a reduction in the quality of goods and services we produce and in technological stagnation. And this would alter our everyday lives. We're dependent on quality services like healthcare, online banking, or the postal services, postal service, and quality goods in the food we consume or the electronic devices we use. And technological stagnation should worry all of us because we need progress if we hope to solve today's pressing issues, most notably the ecological crisis. Therefore, not only is Marxism unlikely to happen, but we should not let pushing for it distract us from the real aim of reforming capitalism. Hence, I urge you to vote opposition in today's debate.